Hello there, this is John Evans, and welcome to our first audio podcast of Book and Spade. In today's episode of Book and Spade, we will be dealing with our research pertaining to the eyewitnesses of Noah's Ark. All of you are aware of modern expeditions to Mount Ararat in Armenia on the Turkish border and Russian border for lost remnants of Noah's Ark. The most famous of these investigations were conducted by the former astronaut Jim Irwin around the 1980s and 1990s. Many of you are also aware that an expedition to find the Ark was conducted by the Base Institute and Bob Cornuke in the early 2000s. And you are also aware, most likely, of the research associated with the Answers in Genesis team, claiming that either the Ark is lost or that it is not located in Armenia. Of course, there is the other option, that the text is entirely allegorical or based off of a localized flood, and therefore no remnants of the Ark would then continue to exist. I am of the personal opinion that the Ark does exist, and that it does reflect a greater historical understanding of the book of Genesis, as it has been traditionally understood. However, I am offering up all available evidence so that we together, as explorers of the truth, can make up our own mind, and so that we can collectively continue to search for remnants of the antediluvian world. I am also persuaded that greater research should be conducted in the area of Armenia. We understand that many investigations have been mounted to Mount Ararat. However, just because the entire mountain has been combed from top to bottom doesn't mean that we understand all of the mysteries, folklore, and associated uh, chronicles, which uh, have been delved into in research beforehand. There are some facts which can slip through our fingers. And I am dedicating this inaugural podcast to discussing one such ancient investigation. It was conducted by someone who was at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. The Council of Nicaea helped clear issues of Christology, who Jesus is. Begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. And at this council, we had some of the greatest of all saints arguing for an orthodox understanding of Christ's person. These included St. Athanasius. This included St. Nicholas. But it also included a figure who has been obscured throughout the years. A Syrian bishop by the name of James or Jacob of Nisibis. Who is this mysterious and enigmatic bishop? His student Ephraim the Syrian tells us that he was one of the chief signatories of the canons at Nicaea, that he defended the orthodox view, that he was a man of great oratory and passion, defending the work presented in Holy Scripture. We also know that he was an early explorer hunting for evidence of Noah's Ark. Now, in Nisibis, in around 308, he was named the bishop. And we know that his student, Ephraim the Syrian, has long been attributed as the author of a long apocryphal book called The Book of the Cave of Treasures. Ephraim's authorship of this ancient text is highly disputed and is generally dismissed by scholars. But I'm convinced that sections of the text pertaining to the mountain on which Noah's Ark rests, or mountains, in Genesis 6-8, through does contain material 
which could orally go back to Ephraim or have been produced by Ephraim's school. We have in the Book of the Cave of Treasures descriptions of Noah's family, descriptions of the flood, descriptions of the landing site in high detail. Where did Ephraim get all of this information? Some of it could be a matter of imagination. Some of it could go back to sources now lost. Or it could have come from a man who went hunting for the ark in antiquity. Maybe Jacob of Nisibis himself. So who is this Jacob? Well, we hear that in Nisibis, when people were speaking against the historicity of the great worldwide flood, James thought that he would go searching for concrete evidence of, of its existence. Now, since the time of Flavius Josephus in the first century AD, there were already eyewitness reports of a dark object in the highest reaches of a mountain, somewhere in and around the mountains of Ararat. Now, the term Ararat refer, uh, referred to a mountain range which was much broader than the area we find in modern-day Armenia. But all of our earliest sources seem to point to the greater and lesser peaks of Ararat as the primary candidate for eyewitness reports. Flavius Josephus refers to a pagan author, Barosus, in the court of Alexander the Great, who describes people traveling up to visit the Ark, chipping off pieces of Bedouin, and bringing these pieces uh, down as amulets worn presumably around the neck as charms for good fortune or good luck. This obviously reflects a more pagan worldview, but it does reflect some interest in trying to bring down tangible pieces of what was a clear vessel. And obviously, if people were visiting on Mount Ararat in Turkey, particularly Greater Ararat, uh, remnants of a ship, James would have known about it as a man of great learning. We know that he founded the monastery school of Nisipus, according to Ephraim. Here texts would have been collected. Here documentation, biblical apocrypha, the testaments of the patriarchs, for example, may have very well been preserved. Therefore, this learned man was going to become a mountaineer and go hunting for relics which he genuinely had good cause to believe existed. So using, therefore, presumably, according to our guesswork, the writings of Flavius Josephus, the recollections of Barosus, and maybe, just maybe, other eyewitness reports. Legend has it, he arrived in Armenia, and he began climbing up the mountain. Now, according to Ephraim and other sources, he stopped partway up the mountain. He woke up and continued his journey, but he woke up in the same place where he started. He woke up again, climbed, Lord knows how much higher up the mountain, and woke up once more in the exact same place. The primary sources suggest that he did this for seven years. Along this journey, so the story goes, he calls out to God in great vexation. An angel appears to him with timbers from the holy ark, saying that he cannot approach the ark but that these timbers are authentic. He carries the timbers down the mountain and presents them to his friends in Nisibis. The relics are preserved there, and later on, when St. Jacob's Monastery is built on Mount Ararat, relics of the Ark are shown in the 19th century, around the 1850s, to Parrot and other climbers attempting to reach the summit of Mount Ararat. These wooden relics are visible in the 19th century, and we have eyewitnesses noting their existence. Of course, we know in the 19th century, 
a great earthquake occurred near the Ahura Gorge. The earthquake, the earthquake literally sends um, hundreds of feet of rock and soil and ice on top of the monastery. The monastery is buried and no access to the relics um, has ever been launched. But in the Holy Echmiazin Church in, Ar- in, uh, in the Orthodox Communion, we know that relics associated with St. James are still preserved, including wood samples attributed to the Ark. Have these wood samples ever been tested? To my knowledge, no. And apart from references to them on the Kolbe site for research into um, the theology of creation, I am unaware of any other references to them. So, we are left with a question. Can we rely on this legend? Obviously, it seems unusual that James would receive these relics at the hands of a holy angel and not actually see the Ark himself in person. Why not visit the Ark landing site, receive the relics, and return home with more evidence associated with the historicity of Noah? If God is seeking to vindicate his narrative as expressed by the hand of Moses, who is redacting the texts of Genesis to us, then why would he not allow his faithful holy servant, James, to go and see the ark with his own eyes? I think there are two possible options in in regards to this legend. One is that God did send a holy messenger to send wood samples to James. I think anyone who studied angelology or demonology knows that the angelic has played a major role not only in the history of Mother Church, but also to in secular affairs, for God is in control at all times and in all seasons. However, as far as I'm aware, this legend does not come from Nisibis himself, but from Ephraim and from his school. Ephraim produced or seemingly was associated with the lost book of the Cave of Treasures, narrating the lives of the patriarchs from Adam down to the present day. Is it possible that the legend associated with James not seeing the Ark was produced by some very holy and pious men and women in Armenia who didn't want people to go and visit the Ark and remove too many timbers from it, thus destroying the site. Broses says in antiquity that people chipped off pieces of this relic to bring it down. If you have pilgrims coming to the site for hundreds of years, they would ship this ship into pieces and there would be nothing left of it. So by creating a narrative in which James does not find the landing place, but is still given relics, is it a way of protecting the location of the Ark so that eager pilgrims do not demolish the site entirely? Clearly, in my opinion, James must have either seen the Ark or have been told a lot about its location, because in the Book of the Cave of Treasures, we have a complete narrative as to the exact nature of the Ark, where it lands, how it lands, how Shem and and Melchizedek arrive in the Ark to find the bones of Adam and carry them to Jerusalem. These are details which are unprecedented in the Apocrypha. It's my own personal opinion that James may have brought back more than wood fragments to Nisibis. He may have brought back exact details. But that the school associated with Ephraim, not wishing to place this relic in jeopardy, altered the original form of the narrative so that James did not approach the site. I understand that this requires dishonesty on the part of those who redacted 
the version of James finding the relic. And I would not want to impute any dishonesty to the saints Ephraim or James. And I don't think we would have to, considering these legends do not come from either figure, but from the monasteries associated with them. Nevertheless, I think this issue deserves greater investigation, and it deserves a greater, uh, I think, seriousness on the part of those interested in searching for the historicity of the book of Genesis. Stay tuned for next time, and please let me know what you think. God bless.